Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Welcome. My name is Michael Doody. I'm a counselor with the city of Timmins and a member of the Northern Caucus. The objective for our session this morning is to share practical guidance and tools specifically for municipal councillors in understanding asset management planning and councillors' roles in decision-making and ensuring the best performance of municipal assets. Our speakers this morning will provide perspectives and tips on service levels, financial assets, communicating with the public on asset management, implementing and enhancing management plans, and some best practices in asset management policy. I will introduce at the same time the three speakers. Our first speaker will be Mr. Michael Fenn. Michael works as a management consultant at Fenn Advisory Services, Inc. He was an Ontario Deputy Minister under three premiers, following which he served as CEO of several Crown agencies. His municipal career included being City Manager of Burlington and later CAO of Hamilton-Wentworth Region. He has been profiled with a chapter in Professor David Siegel's new book, Leaders in the Shadows. Mr. Fenn has written extensively on investment in public infrastructure. In 2010, he was one of two Ontarians named to the Association of Municipalities of Ontario's honor roll. Our second speaker will be John Burke. John retired from the Ontario government at the end of 2011, following 42 years of public service at the municipal and provincial levels. He spent the last 12 years as Ontario Deputy Minister of Natural Resources, Municipal Affairs and Housing, Community Safety and Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Prior to that, John spent almost 30 years in municipal government in Nova Scotia, Alberta and Ontario, starting in municipal finance and progressing to CAO. His Ontario experience included being CAO in the cities of North Bay, Gloucester and Ottawa, as well as the region of Halton. Our third speaker, John Burke. Still, I'm sorry, John. John has a Bachelor of Commerce degree from St. Mary's University in Halifax, as well as a diploma in public administration from the University of Western Ontario. In addition, he is a graduate of the Institute of Corporate Directors Program at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Business. In 2011, he was selected for the prestigious Robert Baldwin Award in recognition to local government in Ontario. John is originally from Nova Scotia, but currently lives in Oakville, Ontario. He sits on the board of directors of Halton Health, which serves the communities of Milton, Halton Hills, and Oakville. Our third speaker will be Don May. Don is a professional planning consultant, a member of the Canadian Institute of Planners and former president of the Ontario Provincial Planners Institute. Don also has a background in public administration and mediation. Over the past 25 years, Don has worked in the municipal, private and consulting fields, preparing, processing and evaluating planning applications, including official plan amendments, rezonings, subdivisions, site plans, minor variances, severances, expropriation, and special permits within the Parkway Belt and Niagara Escarpment. He has provided professional planning opinions to municipal councils, committees of adjustment, land division committees, conservation authorities, the Ontario Municipal Board, Consolidated Hearings Board, Ontario Courts and the National Energy Board, and mediation in land use and expropriation matters. Ladies and gentlemen, now our first speaker. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, Michael. We uh, three are very pleased to be here. We uh, uh, are going to try and make a topic that might potentially uh, seem to some as uh, uh, being uh, having less than sizzle, but uh, you made the long walk down to the end of the hall to hear us, and we're going to deliver on a, a good uh, presentation, we hope. And uh, uh, if you uh, 
look at the uh, material that uh, at the front of the room or online there are uh, there's a publication that deals with some of this material uh, both uh, a set of questions to be posed by members of council as well as uh, some background that will really reflect what it is uh, the presentation uh, uh, lays out today uh, I would say that uh, uh, this focus of this uh, uh, th and this is a, an example of the presentation which you can get online um, the focus of this is very much on council members. Uh, you have co competent municipal staff that know all about this sort of thing. Some of you have attended some of the other sessions on asset management. This is particularly focused on your uh, responsibilities as council members uh, in this important, in the important area. Um, let's see where we are here. Um, there are three key points here in terms of the approach we're going to take. What is asset management? and its benefits and developing new procedures and adopting uh, best practices for asset management. It's a challenging uh, balancing act and it's uh, one wi which competes against other priorities. Assets should be uh, um, uh, very much annual budget priorities, uh, not just something that uh, you deal with when you acquire them and, and, uh, or dispose of them. They have significant financial obligations that have been broadened in the 21st century as you're, as you're aware of. Um, the assets include a lot of uh, things beyond just physical assets, uh, and that's an important uh, expansion in their, in their role. The, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of asset management uh, uh, in, in terms of council's responsibilities, as well as those of, of for, uh, that you have as individual council members, and your broader fiduciary responsibility. The, um, technical part of asset management, I, as I said, is in good hands. Uh, there are, uh, the role of council member is, is very, very much to ask questions about that and to understand the implications and then explain the issue uh, in terms that residents will understand because it, uh, uh, making provision for the future and maintaining good assets is often uh, something that uh, doesn't compete as well with some of the other priorities that the community wants you to address. Uh, there is a fiduciary responsibility you have, which is uh, your custodianship of these assets. Across Ontario, municipalities have invested billions over the years in these assets. Uh, municipalities are the custodians of most, or, or, or a majority of Canada's uh, public infrastructure, and you need to uh, recognize that those past investments by taxpayers are things that need to be husbanded well and, uh, and maintained, uh, both for your own uh, uh, term as well as for future generations. There are some uh, good materials available from the municipal finance officers and other organizations that speak to this, but your staff is well aware of them, and so the focus of our presentation is going to be more on the, uh, on the responsibilities you have as council members. And in that respect, I think it's important to make a clear distinction between uh, the roles. The, uh, the, uh, Municipal assets themselves are, are also important to understand. They, they, are, uh, they really only exist to provide programs and services to your residents and to your business taxpayers. Uh, they are uh, an important ingredient in community governance, as uh, Don May will speak to uh, later on. It, it, they affect things uh, from ranging from land use planning to traffic control. Uh, they are um, uh, they're an important uh, element in the, in the vi viability of your municipality. And so as a result, they're directly related to the, the management of assets is directly related to your strategic plan and, and uh, your strategic priorities as a council uh, to the annual budget, uh, both capital and operating, as well as your multi-year forecasting, uh, land purchases and leases and things of that kind, as well as uh, the uh, responsibilities that individual departments have, uh, whether it's uh, arenas or roads. We uh, like to look at this as uh, something that should be looked at, uh, considered from three lenses. The first is uh, to look at uh, uh, what should your municipal programs and service offerings be. Uh, the reason you have assets is to deliver these services. You don't maintain the assets just for their own sake. They need to serve a uh, purpose in, uh, in your world. The second is to consider the concept of return on investment. When you expend taxpayers' money, particularly on things that are long-lived, it's important to understand what you're getting for them and make sure that they continue to provide benefits uh, uh, if you can do that. And then that leads to the third lens, which is, are there ways in which it, by taking a less traditional approach or a more uh, holistic approach to these assets, you can generate more dividends or, or increase the productivity of your municipal organization through the more productive use of your, uh, of your assets? 
the important questions really to ask on this uh, are, we like to think it's a, some, something of a, of a Rubik's Cube, I suppose, or a matrix. Uh, there are, the tip sheets themselves lay out uh, five categories of things that we're going to walk through fairly uh, briskly. And if you look at each of those uh, five categories with the, uh, uh, with the three lenses, you're going to get a, a number of different decision points along the way. Or we're not trying to make it unnecessarily complicated, but the point is it's a very much a sort of a three-dimensional decision-making environment that you have to, uh, have to consider. So your job as a council member, as any member of a board of directors of a private company or a crown corporation would be, uh, the, if you go to the, the corporate governance training programs, they always say that the, the job of a council member or a director is to ask questions. It's not to substitute your judgment for somebody else's who's a professional in the field, but it is your obligation on behalf of your ratepayers and, and the corporation to ask questions. So in the toolkit document, uh, we've, uh, we've included a, a, a specific set of guides on what questions you should pose. So there, there are, uh, when you are presented, say, with your asset management plan and you're considering the future use of assets, there are things that you should be asking yourself and, uh, and asking your staff and, and uh, talking about in the public forum. So what future choices are being made if we go this way? Uh, are we effectively changing the service levels by treating assets in, in one way or another or investing in them or maintaining them or neglecting to maintain them? Uh, are we doing a robust risk assessment because in some cases uh, uh, the things that we've had to worry about in the past are, are not what we have to worry about in the future, so uh, uh, major storm events and things of that kind are much more frequent than they used to be, so just replacing what we have may not be the only approach. Uh, should there be a higher process uh, uh, priority placed on assets that are prone to risk or fail in natural emergencies or, or man-made disasters, human-made disasters? In the current situation, it took many years to develop uh, the, the deficit we have in deferred maintenance, for example, and you need to have a, an orderly plan, a, cons a consistent approach to getting to you know, digging your way back out of those uh, deferred uh, maintenance uh, issues, uh, but it is important to make a start. Uh, the future choices are important. What, what decisions are we making by approaching asset management in a particular way that uh, preclude other decisions or make other decisions more difficult or, or presuppose certain directions are going to be followed and so on. So I mean it's basically a question of if we do this then what are we not going to be able to do somewhere else? If we do this now what are we not going to be able to do in the future? Uh, if we do this now what will we be able to do as a result of more effectively using our assets? In the tip sheet we said um, I guess we're now up to uh, John. So John's going to talk to you a little bit about us. We, uh, we've organized this. We try to make it as painless as possible and to make it as easy to follow as possible. So we've organized it in terms of tip sheets and questions to pose and, and, uh, and ways in which you can look at issues so that they apply whether you're a large municipality or a small municipality, whether you're long experienced or just new to the job. So John's going to give you the benefit of his uh, insights on, on the next set. Thanks. And don't get too enthusiastic because I'm afraid I'm going to be back. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to roll this back just one slide um, for my part of the presentation. First of all, uh, thank you for inviting us here this morning. It's a pleasure to see so many faces that I haven't seen for a few years and always good to sort of reconnect with that center, that, that sector, even though I haven't been in in uh, much visibility to many of you for probably the last three and a half years uh, just after I retired. But just turning back to the slide that you're seeing on the, on the screen here, tip sheet 1A uh, on service levels, uh, as Michael said, there are three lenses we've suggested that you look at as you make uh, your decisions on assets and asset management plans. And the first lens is really around your program offerings and what level of service ought to be uh, considered. I'm sure that you've, if you haven't, you will certainly be shortly uh, through budgetary uh, sessions. Those budgetary sessions are really about making choices with the scant number of dollars that you have. And a good starting place uh, is on the current service offerings that you, that you provide. Whether or not it's still appropriate, whether they ought to be changed, whether your community is growing, uh, whether there are demographic changes in your community, all of these things will influence uh, what kind of offerings you have. So if you look at it from the point of view of uh, a start point, 
you really should look initially at, well, what's mandatory and what's discretionary? Because not all of these service uh, offerings are equal. They're not all the same and they don't all have the same value. Some you have no choice uh, in providing. So where you don't have a choice, uh, those decisions are essentially made. However, where you do have some flexibility in that is to what level of service are you going to provide? How, how extensive is it going to be? What's your target audience? And is that audience changing year to year? Often staff will, and, and council members, will just assume that what you've done in the previous year is just good enough and you kind of just add or you take away from that. But the thoughtfulness at the beginning of what you're currently doing and at what level you're doing sort of sets the stage on, on where you go from there. And again, as you're looking at these service levels uh, and offerings, uh, make sure you keep in mind that they need to be sustainable. If they're worth doing now, they're probably worth doing in the future. And the decisions you make today will build that expectation for future years with its attendant costs. So affordability obviously comes into uh, the picture as well. Uh, this slide, uh, 1A, is slide 9. So what's the return on, on your investment? So if you think of taxes, so what, what's your mindset when you hear taxes? Is it a burden, as people often call it? Uh, or is it a pooling of money that's been contributed by the community? Uh, I would, I've always tended to look at it as people's money that we're entrusted to make wise decisions with. And I realize that's a valuative term, but nonetheless, that's how people in the community tend to see it. I do not see taxes as a burden. We would not have the communities we have now if this was simply just people paying money uh, to go into a black hole somewhere with no accountability attached to it. So if you look at return on, on investments, and then you look at, well, what are other municipalities doing? It's a, it's a great way to get a sense of, there's lots of very good practices going on out there, and you will learn a lot from one another. Not somebody who's going to come in and sort of read the Bible to you in terms of what you ought to be doing. The third uh, lens is how you leverage your existing assets. So how do you generate more dividends from that? How do you increase your productivity? Don May is going to speak a bit more to his ideas on that, on that topic. But if you look at the differentiation of spending uh, versus investing, if you look at rate of return, typically what comes to mind is, well, that's like interest that you're getting on investments. Well, believe me, that is one definition of it in, in local government. We do make cash investments and we expect to get interest or, or some benefit out of that. But you can also look at it from the point of view in broadening the definition of rate of return to how reliable is the service that you're providing? Is there going to be downtime in those services? What about the reputation of the municipalities if things don't work, if the water shuts off? or if there are programs that people rely on that are not going to happen. So the confidence, reputation of, of council, excuse me, uh, uh, comes, to, comes to play and people will uh, make judgments around that. So this is really all around setting priorities that reflect what people think is important in the community. Uh, the next slide uh, is on financial assets. So what resources do you have and are they appropriate to get the job done? Now on the slide it says eight possible questions to determine whether you have adequate financial resources and of course the issue of asset valuation. The eight questions that are referred to here are actually in the toolkit and I noticed there were several of them on the front table here. I don't know how extensive, uh, extensively they're available but they are available on the website. So you will be able to go there and just see what's included. But anyway, on page six of that, of, that, uh, uh, of that toolkit, you will find those eight questions. Do we have the, the money to do the job? Very important. So you need to look at what your sources of revenue are and you need to understand what they all mean and what they all stand for. So reserves, reserve funds, what are your tax collection rates? That will determine on how much interim borrowing you're going to do if you're not collecting at a suitable enough rate. Uh, chargebacks, uh, borrowing capacity, all of these things play into your ability of what you're going to be able to do. 
Are the assets performing adequately? Have they been kept in a state of good repair? Or are they lagging, as Michael mentioned uh, a few minutes ago? Have we optimized our fees and charges? Do we have a full cost pricing policy? In other words, what do the rates really reflect? Are they just simply what we've done in the past with a little bit of incremental increase? Or are they actually thought through in terms of what are our cost structures? And what revenues do we really need to have in order to maintain them at that level? Uh, the next slide is, uh, is 1B on the financial assets themselves. Cookie jar financing is a Michael Fenn term. Uh, if you read the, uh, the toolkit, I won't go through all the, uh, but it's essentially the idea of matching your revenues and your spending. Uh, the accounting rules determine as well what you're able to do and in what order you're able to do it and under what rules. Uh, the reporting requirements. So looking at, at the accounting rules will give you a sense of how much flexibility you have in how assets are to be treated and how transactions are to be treated. There's only so much money to go around and those rules can influence your decision. So that's why leveraging, looking for ways to squeeze a little money out of these assets will sometimes help you get to where you need to get to ensure that those services are provided. Uh, the other point that I wanted to make on this slide is that you may know, uh, depending on what community you're in, that departments tend to look at whatever money they raise, quote unquote, as being theirs. So they look at the organization in a very silo uh, kind of way, so that the money they spend, the money they're able to earn, they kind of take a little ownership of that. Well, I, I'm here to tell you as an elected official, there's nothing wrong with them having that point of view, but it's okay to cast your eyes in a more horizontal fashion than just the vertical fashion that some may want you uh, to look at. Uh, our next slide is on, again on financial assets, uh, leveraging the value of assets and making prudent investments. So look at balancing the investing in capital assets, organize your financial affairs, Structure your financing of capital assets, and, and really what that means is have a look at assets that where you have an opportunity to either unlock some value or be able to raise revenue to a level that's higher and perhaps even more reflective of what the cost is to provide those services. Are we getting the best from the uh, investment decisions that we're making? Are you giving priority to those assets that actually generate revenue as opposed to some that don't? Some of them, as you know, are necessary. They're all necessary to provide services one way or another, but some actually make money for you as opposed to others that are essentially uh, expenditure uh, centers. Do we simply uh, invest as sometimes is recommended to you uh, by replacing the assets we have or extending the life of those assets through some new changes or new technologies that are available. In some cases, you even want to ask the question, do we actually even need this asset today? Are there new ways of providing it in a way that still keeps those services available to the public, but in a way that doesn't require you to have the same type of assets that you've had in the past? And of course, any, any financial person will tell you that you want to avoid year to year having big peaks of spending and then troughs of spending, that you try to level it off as much as you can. So having plans that sort of map out when you're gonna have to make those investments will help you uh, deal with a more stable kind of uh, situation. Uh, the next slide is uh, tip sheet two, communicating benefits of asset management to the public. Well, you know, the elected officials are probably the ones who know best and are closest to the public that they're serving. And for many of you who have been around for many years, you know that staying in touch with those person and having a sense of what the community needs and wants will help drive your decisions along the way. In the, in the uh, toolkit, again, there are five ideas uh, to help with making unsavory choices uh, regarding higher costs or, or poorer services. It, it will give you some guidance on that. Public engagement requires education, creativity, and, and clear messaging. Well, again, the tools that are available to us today are much greater than they would have been in my early years in local government. You know, with the social media uh, uh, tools that 
uh, excuse me, that are available today, it's much, much easier, I think, to stay in touch and get immediate feedback from the public uh, than ever before. But remember, there are still people in those communities who, who are at the center of protecting certain assets, even if it's at the expense of others. Uh, they have special interests, as we like to call them. And so you need to be mindful of balancing those special interests with the broad interests of the community. Just because nobody's bellying up to a mic to tell you about this doesn't mean that it isn't important to maintain. Uh, the next slide on 14, uh, again, are community benefits, uh, are the benefits of communicating to this. So on the one hand, don't get too far out in front of the public if you're truly interested in their advice uh, to you on what decisions to make on assets, but don't get too far behind either because these, these uh, matters need some management and order along the way, but the important thing to do is to listen and to make sure that whatever you end up making by way of decision is affordable and sustainable into the, into the long haul. So what's the best way to set these kinds of priorities? Uh, doing it right might, uh, might be a little longer, even a little more expensive, maybe not even that politically palatable. But if you look at the community uh, from an ongoing basis, it has to often be looked at far beyond just the, the four-year term that, uh, that counselors have. Uh, the third uh, tip sheet has to do with maximizing the use of available tools. There are lots of very good tools in our communities, and I'm sure all of you either use them today or know of places where they, where they, uh, they are. But Ontario is actually full of really, really good uh, practices in this regard. And your staff, if you ask them or if you ask colleagues from across Ontario, they'll be happy to provide you with m models of what they do. Cambridge, I, I, I don't mean to just signal one, Cambridge happens to have a really good uh, process for doing this and they uh, combine kind of low-tech and high-tech uh, ways of being able to get at their, at their uh, asset management plans. Above all, and this is kind of something you want to keep in the back of your mind as you raise your questions to do your job, is if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, and if you don't measure it, you won't manage it. And I'm talking about the services and the decisions around assets that need to, uh, to accompany that. Another good example is this really, really busy slide you're seeing here. It tries to capture the universe of asset management planning. This is a framework that the City of Ottawa has prepared. And as you can tell, uh, well, you, you may not be able to tell by reading it at this point, but it has all the essential features of how to build a plan and maintain a plan and all the inputs that need to, to go into that plan. It will work, I can assure you, as well in Kenora as it does in Ottawa. It starts with defining and understanding your reporting requirements, which is that far left, your left, uh, uh, bar that, that runs vertically. In the center is kind of the core of this policy uh, framework, and it covers really what you do to meet your objective of getting a plan. I'm not going to get into every bit and piece on this, but really it's, it's the model that gets you to your end game. The purple at the one closest to me, the vertical bar, is really that when you've developed the plan, the plan is not an end. It's a, it's a very dynamic process that goes on year after year, and you should always circle back to see if this thing is actually doing what you plan to do in the first place. That, it, that it's really performing the way, the way that you've designed it. Uh, my final slide in my portion of the presentation really deals with uh, tip sheet three, as you see here, tools already in the toolbox. I've mentioned that already. Uh, the tying the use of services to the type of cost to me is really important, even if you don't charge fees. Knowing and understanding the cost structures of your assets and your, uh, and your uh, services is vital. Whether you decide to charge fees for those is really a policy decision that council makes. In some cases, it's pretty standard that you're going to do that. In other cases, it's, well, maybe we don't want to do too much of that. But you should know what your rec programs cost you to deliver, regardless of what you're charging to, to recover those costs. Uh, 
So that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is, is my portion of the presentation. I'd like to now turn it over to my colleague, uh, Don May. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, John. Um, just before I start, as I sit there as the real estate guy, thinking about the, John's point about the rate of return and, and uh, that whole concept. So trying to visualize an example. So you're working with the local college and you want to build an entrepreneurial hub in your community and bring people and business together. And it's going to cost you a million and a half dollars to build this facility. On the other hand, you have a leisure center, you have many, but you have this leisure center that is exclusively used by a bridge club that uh, is in a significant property that could probably be moved to a church or somewhere in the community. And, and, and you have to be able as counselors to see the silos that are involved in those decisions between economic development and, and the recreation part of the community. And those are, that's the reason we're talking about counselors being able to uh, transcend the silos and look at the priorities and ask the real questions about other things. But the invest portion, something that I've been working on over the last few years and I've written in Municipal World and other areas and having the whole notion of a municipality starting to act as a business using its real estate uh, in, in an invest kind of uh, thinking could be a separate presentation all by itself and I've done it on uh, several occasions but basically the municipality has significant real estate assets you have those assets and a lot of people view them as uh, it's uh, your right to hold them and gain more of them and 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 never to consider selling any of those assets and each year uh, you get the assessment registry from uh, Impact, and you you run the computer program with all your assets in the community, and this is the year you're going to review them and you're going to work on them, and slowly it gets put away with staff somewhere because of priorities and other things, and nothing happens with that list to review it. Um, I was fortunate to go to a municipality and look at that list, and there were 163 properties, and we went through the list, and there were all kinds of different pieces. Some were the town hall, and some were parks, but others were just there. And uh, as you ask the hard questions, what about that lot that's in the residential subdivision? It's not a park, it's a lot, and yet you're sending somebody out, you're cutting grass on that lot. It could be a house, it could be uh, revenue on the other side, it's something positive and, uh, as opposed to that. Um, so in having to look through that list each year, it's helpful to have somebody uh, with, with a different vision sort of look through it and make those, make those questions. Um, in many cases, you have to ask yourself, what is the private sector not doing in our community? And, and so it's not for you as a municipality to compete with the private sector, but if they're not doing it, then should you be stepping in and taking that position? In the old days, it was about building industrial parks and putting lots out there for uh, the factory that was going to come up the road as your economic development strategy. Today, it's much more complex. It's much different. So what is that role that you should be taking? Uh, and in talking to the private sector, they can tell you what they would like to see. Um, trying to give you an example. Um, the local builders can't find lots, so they're going out in the townships and building on severances and stuff rather than coming into town. Um, they don't have the money to put in a street because it costs a lot of money to subdivide. So is it your role or responsibility perhaps to put a street in and create those lots and then the builders locally uh, can build on those lots? So again, it's a mindset of dealing with the private sector and, and saying, what could our role be to do? Do we have a property that is very important to the private sector uh, on, on the waterfront? Do we have something that uh, maybe we should trade or, or we should make a move? Uh, in Innisfil, they're moving the public works yard. I'm involved with that. And you're, uh, it's in a strategic location at <laughs> Innisfil Beach Road and Young Street. Uh, it, they can move to a larger site further back. Now it's part of the civic center. Could we get some health care? Could we get some institutional uses in from a strategic point of view on the site that'll make it better for the community? 
So through our action, moving something and then making it more strategic for the, the entire community on your strategic side and having that all work uh, together. And you can realize some funds from some assets, obviously, to use because you're always looking for funds for priorities. So can you get some assets? Are there some road allowances around? Are there some excess lands as you look through it all that you could then trade into, into more important things? And then we talk about the whole issue of joint ventures. Um, land is usually 30 or 40 percent of a deal. So you, right away, you're, you're putting something into the into the venture to have it go forward. Uh, the next point I'm going to make uh, for some of you, it, it may be a sort of a scary thought, but in talking to a board member who had been on the board for about 10 years, he said, the one thing that I noticed is that municipalities don't expropriate often enough for strategic reasons. So there are instances where properties are not going to be developed. The, the owner has no interest in doing that. It is in the way of what the community wants to do and what it has to do, and expropriation is there. And to me, it is a vehicle that needs to be considered from time to time strategically to make things happen. Where uh, a property is uh, uh, holding back an area or something to happen, then it needs to be thought about and it needs to be brought through. And there are all these fears about legal costs and other matters, but at the end of the day, if it's a fair value that's put to the property and the expropriations that I've been involved in, certainly trying to deal with the owner and give them the property, but the decision is made to take the property. So I think, I think on the positive side, those are all the things that, that, uh, that you need to think about um, in, in, in going into the invest side. On the other side, from my experience recently, and I've been working in healthcare for the last 15 years on, on hospital locations and, and uh, selling assets and working through those areas, um, and trying to move that into the municipal sector is very, very difficult because you have um, a, a role where you're approving development and you're doing that role through the planning department and those functions, but trying to ask the planners to also be the developers for you and then there's a perception by the public that they're confused in terms of the is there some special treatment being done for the municipality so i think it's really important to separate the invest initiatives from the inline functions that are going on within city hall and i and um i i to go through some examples uh, locally here fort erie they wanted to purchase a major piece of property in Crystal Beach and it was to achieve a piece of the beach and, and a large part of the woodlot. They also at the same time were able to pre-zone uh, the, the, the net development lands for condo development and were able to attract a condo builder because the approvals were in place and the, and the parts were done. That's the good story. On the other side, the public were very nervous about how that all happened and the conflicts between roles of planners and, uh, uh, and, and, how that, and how that went through. And I think thinking back, again, using examples and expertise, uh, there was a need up front to develop the governance and policy procedures around it before you move ahead. And I, I um, uh, need to explain that carefully because it is important to have policies up front. You need to tell the public why you're looking at these road allowances, what they mean to the municipality in the end in terms of not having to, to uh, maintain these properties and the benefit to the taxpayer. Once you've structured that and you've set it up, then the hard decisions are for you as councillors where somebody has maintained that wood lot as, uh, or that uh, road allowance as their... Um, a kind of extra side yard for for uh, for pleasure, and they don't want to give it up for another house or whatever. So there are some issues around real estate uh, that do need this structure. And uh, coming back to sort of a, an overall point, um, and, and it was mentioned earlier, you may go slower, as John said, to get the policies in place and get some structure within the. Uh, within the staff or you go out and hire that expertise on a part-time basis to uh, fill in the senior team and what's happening and separate 
uh, those roles. And, and uh, the, the, that's very important in, in the perception and how you get through it in the end. Um, in the case of uh, Midland and Wasega Beach, you've got key properties like Indusman in, uh, in Midland where uh, it, it's important for the municipality to buy that property. I, I'm, I wasn't involved in that matter, but they're, they're doing the right thing because often a speculator will buy those properties and will be in the way of what is really what is necessary to a key, key property. And the municipality can now decide what is the public interest, what is the frontage, what is the walkways, uh, what's important to that, and then offer it for sale on a performance basis. So only the property would be sold if someone comes in and assures the, the municipality that they're going to build on it. And this is just temporary. It's funding that's held for strategic properties for the right reason. Wasega Beach would be the other example. Um, significant issues to change, long-term issues after the fire. Uh, a major owner owning in the downtown with no interest really in the short run to develop. So the municipality, in my opinion, have done the right thing. They purchased the property, uh, and it sounds like a lot of money, $16 million. But the, the other thing the municipality has to do is accept that they need to hire professional leasing people, professional responsibility to manage that. It's not enough to just spend $16 million. You've got to manage it and bring in the right expertise to follow through. But it's only temporary. The long-term goal is for the private sector to own those properties and then to move ahead. So I'm trying to explain uh, uh, the invest, and I think the, uh, the, the real important message as you read through the toolkit is to develop a governance structure for council to say why it's doing it with the public and reviewing their assets. And then as you come to the hard decisions, it follows those criteria up front and then moves it through. So in the same way that you, you say to the public, uh, we, need, uh, we need funds for service delivery in order to have other services, maybe we collect garbage once a week instead of twice a week, uh, and that gives us money to then give you this. And, and if you engage in that discussion, the community gets it as to why they're doing their garbage once a week versus twice a week and where those funds are going. The same thing is true for real estate in that you have to explain the structure of the deal and why the municipality is doing it in, and hopefully in a generic sense at the front and then go through and be able to do that because you as council, it's very difficult as you make these decisions in light of, as John said, the special interest groups that want certain assets but don't realize what the value of that is underneath. So the last message is that you, you sometimes have to use your positioning and what you have as an asset to make things happen in your community. And, uh, and, and that's really the message through the, the, the assets. You've got two departments, they're very happy with their own uh, sites, but by, by co-locating the departments together, there's more synergy, there's more efficiencies of scale, there's more things happening with that, but, but the property you choose to make surplus and what it happens is, is being made surplus for other reasons that are strategic and that are gonna help your municipality. So I hope I've tried to explain it uh, in, in, uh, in a clear fashion. Uh, and I will say, don't take a shortcut on it, don't all of a sudden, the problem in real estate is you'll often stay in confidentiality and you won't come out and make enough information. So as much as possible, you have to show the transparent part of the process and get that out and meet with the home builders or meet with the local development groups and, and work through that and have that dialogue and debate about why you're doing it. And only certain parts of the matter are in confidentiality. Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks, Don. Uh, so I'm going to deal with the last two tips and uh, so to suggest some goals, and then uh, we're going to turn it over to Michael to uh, handle the uh, questions and answers. Hopefully we've stimulated some ideas, and if not, uh, perhaps you can give that some thought as I'm uh, going through the last uh, group. I, th I think one of the things that uh, we uh, likely should have said at the outset that, uh, uh, that uh, we neglected to say was 
with, we know that you've all uh, gone through the process that is required by the, the Ministry to develop asset management plans, but they can be a fairly two-dimensional uh, mechanical uh, financial tool. I guess the, our overall message, and, and Bruce McLeod and the Ontario Municipal Knowledge Network, when they uh, invited us to, uh, to help develop these ideas, said, you know, it's important that council members get into this a little bit more to understand some of the policy-making implications, some of the choices that are implicitly being made, and to be more engaged in actively managing this process. So um, with that uh, sort of quick uh, overview comment, I'm going to do with the last two uh, uh, tip sheets. The first is talking about enhancing the asset management planning. So taking what you've done so, so far, which is good, and many municipalities have done a great job on this, and sort of taking it the next stop, uh, 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 supercharging it or turbocharging it to, to make it really pay for your municipality. Uh, one suggestion that uh, is made is to use uh, uh, the concept that you might have run into in other context of value engineering, looking at uh, the full life cycle cost of things, uh, looking at the maintenance costs, uh, asking risk-based questions. Uh, so what happens if we don't do this? Uh, is this going to be enough to deal with this kind of situation and so on? Uh, you'll uh, realize the importance, I think, of integrating asset management planning with other kinds of planning you're doing. You've got an obligation to do accessibility planning. That has implications for buildings and structures. Uh, you're looking at energy costs and ways in which those can be reduced. That's uh, very much part of asset management planning. And likewise, uh, uh, planning priorities, uh, as, as Don was just talking about. And uh, it's not all on the good side. Uh, we are seeing now that uh, we have 100-year storms that we're seeing three times in a decade. So the infrastructure designs that used to work for culverts or for uh, uh, for storm, stormwater management in the past may not be good enough. And we need to ask questions that uh, in, in, to talk about the resilience and the ability to get things back online. If, uh, uh, if your uh, water system goes out, you want to have confidence that there's enough resilience in the system to be able to get things back in working order in short, in short term. Um, so uh, we mentioned, I mentioned earlier about the importance of integrating asset management with other things that you're doing that have this forward-looking uh, flavor. Uh, such as uh, uh, energy conservation, uh, land use planning decisions, and asset uh, management plans, and the hidden costs of some of your planning decisions. So you may do something in your recreation master plan or your land use plan that has real public works cost implications. You need to tease that out, make sure that when you're building something, if it's going to have some on ongoing operational costs that's not immediately visible to you, uh, that if there's a choice to be made, maybe you invest a little bit more at the front end to reduce administrative costs or, or operational costs over the longer term. And to treat things very much on a full cycle basis, so both when you're setting rates and when you're uh, looking at the, uh, the bu annual budget for these kinds of enterprises. Uh, I think another thing about uh, uh, asset management is to, to consider the broad definition of assets. I mean, we, you, you can get your mind around real estate and, uh, and physical assets like a grader or things of that kind, but there are all kinds of things that you're doing that really have asset value, may or may not be reflected on your financial statement. So you'd have things like there are a number of municipalities that have uh, what in the provincial and federal level will be called go government business enterprises. So commercial type activities that you're engaged in, either on a monopoly basis or, or even in some cases in a, in a competitive kind of environment, uh, that are assets that have value, that if in the hands of somebody else might have value, and you need to consider that. Uh, there's a, a movement afoot, and I guess the Hydro One's probably the best example, but it's maybe not the, the, the example I would cite here, of ways in which uh, you can decide how you acquire assets, uh, whether they should be involved in uh, a partnership with the private sector, how you manage assets, whether the private sector in some respects can do, or the not-for-profit sector or the voluntary sector can do uh, as good a job in terms of the management role as you could at perhaps a better cost or better uh, quality outcome. And then also on the disposition side, once something's no longer a priority of the community, uh, <laughs> there are costs associated with carrying an asset that isn't top priority uh, that could be disposed of to reduce your capital costs for other undertakings or to reduce the operating costs of maintaining those assets, as, as Don was saying. Even something as, as innocent as having a, a couple of lots scattered around town for which you've got to uh, buy insurance coverage, uh, um, ensure that the lots are, are uh, maintained, uh, fenced, all those kinds of hidden costs. I think it's important to, to look at this in those, in those contexts. Um, so uh, that's uh, the idea of, of using legacy infrastructure that is not top priority to help you uh, go forward. Now some people will suggest it's like uh, selling the furniture to pay for the groceries, but I don't think it's that way. It's more like selling your old car to somebody who really wants it so you have money to buy a new car. And I think that's the approach that uh, asset uh, recycling should take. 
It's also important, as, uh, was, as John Burke was mentioning, to do benchmarking. Talk to other municipalities, look at municipalities in your group, develop, uh, get your staff to do a sort of a market basket of comparable municipalities and see what they're doing and see if you can borrow ideas. The beauty of the municipal world, of course, is uh, you're not in competition with each other other than maybe for economic development. Uh, so you'll, there's a custom or a, uh, a tradition of sharing ideas freely and openly uh, and, uh, and you should take advantage of that because uh, somewhere on Ontario's 444 municipalities, somebody's already had your problem and either tried something that won't work, which you ought to know about, or tried something that was successful that, uh, that you can copy. The, um, the goals, I guess, what, that we're trying to uh, um, uh, emphasize here are that uh, you need to develop an asset management culture so it's not dead letter, that it's uh, something that's ongoing and is tied into other things you're doing, budgetary, planning policy, uh, um, programming, and so on that you focus on continuing improvement, uh, so it's not always uh, hitting home runs. Uh, often it's a whole collection of singles that gets you the kinds of results that you want to get, and that it's fully integrated into your financial planning and into your sustainability planning, because increasingly with uh, both with uh, uh, fiscal sustainability and with climate change impacts, it's important to uh, make sure you're building the right infrastructure and building the infrastructure right. So um, the uh, the, the final summary is that you need to look at your assets in terms of the role they play in delivering municipal services and programs. They don't exist uh, in isolation. They exist only for that purpose and you need to tie them back to that regularly. Don't get locked into uh, thinking about your assets uh, only when you buy them or only when they're used or uh, in, in a capital uh, investment terms or a uh, big maintenance contract or, or when you dispose of them. It needs to be a full cycle sort of approach. and that. Uh, Really good management of assets should be a budget priority every year and not just uh, in the year they're acquired and not just as uh, John was saying, not just the, for the department that happens to have uh, custodianship over them. There are maybe lots of situations where realty assets or financial assets or even equipment assets ought to be viewed as corporate resources, as municipal resources rather than departmental resources. So the bottom line I guess is that you as, um, where are we here? Um, I think I've covered all that. So um, the, the, the bottom line is that uh, you as council members really have an important and distinct role. You're not, your job is not to meddle in management, you're, but your job is to oversee uh, a process to make sure that it's developing the, 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 the opportunities that are there, that the, the assets are, in, in the terminology we used earlier, paying dividends, either by allowing you to avoid costs or allowing you to use assets to generate additional revenue opportunities or to make choices that will reduce your uh, uh, vulnerability and uh, that's an important role for a council member as a fiduciary and a custodian and it uh, fits nicely with the job of professional management to, uh, to do the right thing in terms of asset management planning and, and financing. So with that I guess we'll uh, turn it back to uh, Michael and uh, oh I guess I should say one other thing which is it's been mentioned several times but on the Municipal uh, Knowledge Network uh, website the uh, two publications, the questions and answers for council members to pose and the toolkit itself are available through that uh, website and, uh, and we certainly uh, invite you to take advantage of that free service as part of your AMO dues. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. True story, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I first uh, was elected as a council member in 1970 in Timmins. And uh, a couple of us suggested that maybe every year the city of Timmins should buy a couple of thousand shares in the price of gold. Gold in 1970 was trading at $75 an ounce. It did go to $2,000 an ounce. Presently, it's around $1,200 an ounce. Not a bad investment, eh, fellas? Uh, at this time, by the way, I would like to remind you that this session uh, is being recorded and will be available online at, on the AMO website. Uh, I would like, uh, at this time, before we ask uh, if anyone here would like to ask some questions, I'd like to thank Bruce McLeod for helping us to coordinate uh, this meeting. Uh, if anyone has a question, I invite you to come up to the microphone. Uh, identify yourself in the municipality you are representing. Questions? Uh, 
My name is uh, Mark Signoretti. I'm counselor at uh, Greater City of Sudbury. Uh, the question I have is when you're discussing about assets, when has it become, because I've seen other municipalities do this, instead of purchasing the asset, they'll look at leasing options. So where they make monthly payments on these assets and then they work out an arrangement with a supplier that after a number of years they can return the asset and they're always getting up-to-date assets so it's not hindering repair yep. costs. Okay. <coughs> well, let me take a shot at that and then my colleagues can add to it. Uh, the lease buy uh, question is, is always involved when you're dealing with assets, particularly those that are widely available. And you're right, there, the, there are benefits for sure uh, in being able to have assets that are current, uh, up to date. It, it's really around the pricing of those assets and whether or not you're getting a better deal through a lease than you would through a straight purchase. If your lease includes maintenance as well, which some of them do, but as you know, you'll, you'll pay more for that, there may very well be some benefit there because you don't have to worry about looking after the asset along the way, that, it, that there's a, f a full cost uh, included in that. So you don't worry about the staffing side of it or, or anything like that or, or, or paying some extra costs associated with that or having guarantees that if the thing just breaks down or, or gets used up much earlier than expected, there's a benefit. On everything is balanced out against the cost and your staff are usually in, you know, Sudbury's a, a pretty sophisticated municipality and I'm sure you have the tools and the staff who can do that analysis for you, just the way that you've described it with all the benefits on one side, but also looking at the costs associated with that. And, and it's about, I don't want to oversimplify it, but it usually comes down to that kind of, of give and take uh, scenario. If, if you avoid the big capital up front uh, expenditure and the numbers do work out, of course it does free up some money that would normally be allocated for that particular purpose uh, to be used for, for other purposes. But in the end, uh, everything has a price tag attached to it and a reliability associated with it. Don't forget the guarantee and, and all the other elements uh, associated with that. And, and, and like I say, you probably have professional staff in Sudbury who can give you a pretty good analysis of which would be the better way to go. But it is, it is often a feasible way to go. I think, I think on the property side, you can also use the same scenario. So, I mean, uh, somebody may want to start a business um, and uh, in the community and land cost is going to be a huge factor for that in individual because land is is intensive for the use, say, I don't know, a driving range or something. So you have municipal property, so the person could lease that property from you, try to develop the business and see that it's working, and you're getting a gain for property. Conservation authorities deal with that uh, in terms of leasing and other operations for cash as well. So it can be an opportunity, uh, certainly. And, and as John said, I think often, uh, you don't put the true value to what it is that you own. And when you look at it in a lease relationship, it may free up, again, more value in what you have as a building or, or in property so that it's a real advantage. So I think using those same principles in the real estate side is very important as well. I just wanted to touch on one thing, if I can. Um, and I'll let, if anybody else has a question. Um, it's more municipalities are starting to think like you made that comment about b more like a business and you have to treat it like a corporation where you look at the assets that you do have and we always look for revenue streams and you can only tax the taxpayers so much before they can they'll move out of your city because they're being taxed and they can go to another city and not be taxed as much so that's why leasing whether it's commercial, like a real estate property, or even uh, assets might be a good advantage. So, thank you. Good point. <clears throat> good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Madigan. I'm from the beautiful town of Collingwood. And uh, I don't know if my question will be to Mr. May directly. We have, uh, we're kind of lucky in calling when we have Mr. May at our <laughs> access all the time. Uh, you had mentioned Wasaga Beach. So my question, uh, I'll use Wasaga Beach to uh, 
as a catalyst to the question. Is it our job as councillors to um, negotiate and pay higher than real estate value? Uh, Wasaga Beach was kind of dilapidating and they, they paid more than the estimated value. So is it our job as councillors, are we allowed to um, almost gamble with uh, the taxpayer's money uh, in selling or buying uh, property in our community? As usual, tough question, Bob. But uh, again, what is value? What, and, and what is an appraisal? And, and often an appraisal is a very static item which is based on a willing buyer and a willing seller and there's much more behind it than just that. And in the case of expropriation on the other side, there are significant acquisition costs around the legals and around the other parts. So as I said earlier, you want to treat the owner well rather than pay the outside, you know, uh, I won't say the word, all the professionals around it getting paid as opposed to the owner. So the acquisition itself is a willing buyer and it's a, it's a willing seller that has to be negotiated and done. On the other side, what's the opportunity? So we can have appraisals that are uh, a certain number, but based on rezoning and based on getting the values in place and getting a builder, as in Crystal Beach, to come in and build condos, significantly more value on the other side. So. Uh, you really have to look at, at it in its, in its total um, package. And uh, as I said, for Wasega Beach, often some of the key properties in towns are owned by speculators who have no interest in developing. And yet there's a bigger uh, picture here. There's a bigger waterfront. There's a bigger issue with local economy and, and, and issue. So the value that's paid to it uh, again, it is a complex question and then how it's done. So uh, you really can't look at it from the outside. You really have to get into more of the details of it. And, and being in a municipality, you're subject to um, uh, huge questions by the public and by other people. I'm not saying it's easy. I have found that I did well in healthcare because nobody knew what I was doing. And so therefore, <laughs> I, I was able to do all kinds of stuff with new hospitals and sell hospital sites and stuff and get away with it. Uh, again, nobody knew. As I've moved into municipalities to work on this invest concept, it's been much tougher because councillors uh, have a lot of, of dynamic around it. I'm not, and that's why I've, I've said the, the process and the governance is very, very important structured around it. And as I said at the very beginning, the question you have to ask all the time is, is the private sector doing it? Municipalities should not get into things that, that the private sector and others are doing. And I, I've made that clear. But there are circumstances where you, you might have to do that. Sorry. I, so I, just in addition to, the, to that question, um, <clears throat> I know as a private businessman, I've been able to, to uh, make deals and I, I'm always afraid that uh, as a municipal councillor now when the the buyer sees that it's a township or the city buying it, it drives the value up. Should it be our job as councillors to maybe uh, invest in their community leaders and assist them in helping so we can promote private enterprise within our communities rather than taking something that was uh, valued uh, Resident or real estate wise at 12 million and then paying and I'm just I'm not picking on Wasaga Beach right. But I know that we're going to come up to that in, in my own municipality And I'm sure we've all come across that in in, in their municipalities, yeah. no, but I agree with you if you can get the private sector to do it Absolutely like the you know the bridge club can play at the church and give them some revenue at the church instead and and help the church out like I, I Having, I, 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 it's a last resort that the municipality has to identify what are the things that it can do to change that are game changers. And in the case of Indusman in, in Midland, they had no choice. The other people could have bought that property and frustrated the process. And now having it, they at least control uh, their, their valuable waterfront and they can now decide what it is they want to keep, you know, the, the public right, aspect right. of it, and then uh, put it out there on performance. Uh, I'm working on performance offers all the time where we're looking for property not only to be bought but to have buildings put on them, to have health care put in them or whatever our goal is in the sale. And that's another point. Maybe the sale is is not 
totally market, but it has other aspects in it. But it has to be well defined and back to the public. They need to see that process. He's itching. I like to hear you. Thank you for that. So thank you for that answer. I know it's a complex question, and a lot of people ask complex questions, and they they want an easy answer. And I know there is no easy answer, but I thank you very much. On that note, I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank our three speakers, Michael Finn, John Burke, and Don May, in a very thought-provoking uh, session. And on behalf of AMO, I hope they would uh, uh, receive these tokens in appreciation. Sincere thank you. Thank you, everybody. Merci beaucoup.